Hello and welcome to another photo mishmash. I'm Christina. And I'm Toby. And today is episode 14. We're going to talk about setting goals today. Okay. And we switch places. We switch places. This is my good side. This is my good side. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the week in review. We are going to talk about the week in review. And I was just thinking we wrote that down and then... The one big piece that I wanted to just mention um, is kind of also fits into the news section, mm -hmm. which is Adobe releasing the iPad Lightroom app. Yes, very exciting. It is. Oh, are you? Is it very exciting? Well, I say that. I guess I wasn't being completely honest. I mean, it is really, it, it's a cool thing to be able to edit photos on the go on the iPad. But I think... I don't know. I guess I just kind of feel like overwhelmed with so much work that I didn't really feel like poking it and playing around with it yesterday or today. Yeah, so, right. but it is a cool thing. What do you think about it? Well, imagine the scenario: you, um, you know, photographed a wedding, and you two days later you've got all the pictures into Lightroom. You've sunk them to a collection that goes to your iPad. And, you know, we happen to be driving to another wedding or another shoot and you got two hours in the car. Would you flip through and flag the ones that you want to work with on the iPad? Yeah, that would be kind of a cool thing to do, yeah. Um, I do wonder about speed. I mean, I guess if I do have two hours to kill, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go over those pictures and call on the iPad. However, I would much rather just bring my laptop with me and call there. Um, you know, the screen's a little bit bigger, and um, I can use keys, so that would be much quicker for me. So I think in terms of, like, processing batches of images, I don't know that it'll have, or it'll be very good application for that sort of thing, but in terms of, like, editing personal work or smaller, um, or smaller collections of photos, I think it would work really well. How about this scenario? You're headed off and you want to um, blog about a couple of these images, which you could do from the iPad pretty easily, mm -hmm. or share on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you've put them all in this collection that automatically gets sunk to the iPad before you head out the door makes that pretty easy. Yeah, you're right. It okay. would. Yeah, if, as long as all the plugins, you know, if you use some sort of plugin, if that works. Otherwise, you could be creating more work for yourself. Are you, a preset, do you mean? No, I mean like the export plugins. Like mm -hmm. I use LR Blog to export images. Um, so, but I just, I'm really nitpicky, like way right. too nitpicky about how I arrange my blog posts. But, you know, if I didn't really mind and um, the arrangement so much, then I think that could be. Mm -hmm. Really nice, yeah. Didn't you mention the speed? I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty darn fast and responsive. It's using the smart previews, uh, which is a feature of Lightroom 5, so that's it's pretty slick. It basically makes these kind of smaller nice. raw files, the D and G, uh, and it, that's what it shares. So, I, you know, there are some certainly some limits to it size-wise. Uh, practicality right now because uh, you can't do your own presets, so you use Replicome presets often. Right, yeah. So I would have to have them imported with the presets already on. Yep, edited. And then if there are any additional presets that I would like to apply, I couldn't do that. So that's right. That's kind that's of right. an issue. Yep. It's somewhat limiting, but hopefully those things will um, come down the road. I also would be able to like to tag in keyword. I think that's a really, I think it would be a, I think there's some uh, potential for some really cool ways to do that on iPad yeah. with lots of images of touching. Uh, that's one thing that can be a little bit tedious, although you can use the spray paint can in Lightroom to do keywording. Right. Do you tag and keyword many of your wedding photos? I don't. I should. I should because I would save myself lots of time. Um, you know, I should tag vendor images. I should tag specific days, names, and things like that, but I don't do that. Um, but I should. You should make that a goal. You should make that a goal. <laughs> um, Add it to the list. <laughs> Is the list really big? It's very big. Uh, the other piece of weekend review is that I started to do some more testing with a 70D. I'm looking at it sitting next to the 5D Mark III up there. Um, as I mentioned, this might be frustrating to watch because I'm not really saying anything more than I said last week, so I'll be very brief. More tests, fairly inconclusive, but it still seems to be an issue. Different 
but still an issue. Uh, I, I have it as a goal, that's going to get annoying, uh, that within the next week I really finish up this video, uh, give you some samples, show you the, the issue, because some people have asked to see that, not samples, but like in action, see this issue presenting itself, and then talk a little bit about the micro adjustments of autofocus or AF micro adjustments. I said it right that time. I said it wrong so many times. Um, and show you how you can fix other issues with that, but it doesn't fix the 70D issue. Uh, but still, I'm really, I love the 70D other than that for a lot of different reasons, but yeah. And I don't think there's anything else we can review to talk about. We did a critique. Oh, we did. Oh, thank you. We did a critique. Um, this week that went well. Another good one. A question about from that was well, how you feel about foreground blur in mm -hmm. Danny line shot. Yeah. Um, the people chiming in, the people, are a lot of folks saying they like it. It works well for that image. And that's where I'm ending up as well. Uh, you'd think sometimes that I'd have my mind made up when I'm critiquing images, but I don't. Uh, sometimes I'm like, I can't decide how I feel about that. Uh, but along with that critique is the reminder that we are in the first ever, so exciting, it is, uh, DPR symmetry assignment or DPR photo assignment that Christina gave you all now about a week and a half ago. And that is to go out and take some pictures that exhibit symmetry, tag those. Uh, and link down below to more information. I got a little blog post that tells you more about that. So do that. We will be critiquing those this coming weekend. So you'll see that at the beginning of next week. That's right. That's right. And speaking of reminders, should we remind people of our giveaway? Oh. I'm on the ball today. You're, you're in the in charge <laughs> chair, but you're doing a better job than I do when I sit there. Yes. Uh, we mentioned this last week from the fine, fantastic folks, Lumoid.com, where you can rent gear. And not only can you rent gear, but you can get credit during those rentals towards purchasing it down the road or purchasing some other gear that they have. We're giving away $50. That's enough to get something for a long weekend. Yeah. They've got some really sweet gear. Check it out. Link for that down below. It's really easy to go enter. You can tweet every day to get an extra entry. Uh, so go do that. I entered. I don't think you're allowed to win. <laughs> if your name comes enter. up. I didn't okay. enter. I'm lying. <laughs> Friends and family. Got so angry all so I wasn't quickly. I angry. Um, <laughs> but that reminds me also that a really exciting box from Lumoid is arriving on Friday. And I'll be talking more about that very soon. A hint of what it is is partially in the new... I make everything so convoluted. It's the Sony A7. The Sony A7 with a Sony 35mm lens is coming from Lumoid. I'm going to review that. Uh, and maybe this is a great segue into the news section. Sure. Sure. So, NAB. National Association of Broadcasters is going on right now. We mentioned this a couple weeks ago because there was rumors of different cameras possibly coming out. Haven't seen anything really from Canon um, other than we've updated some firmware and we have these great cameras that do shoot 4K. They're like, hey, remember we do shoot 4K too with their, I don't remember, C100, C300, C500. I think it's the C100. Um, beast of a camera. Very expensive. But yeah, it shoots 4K. Um, but the big news that I think a lot of people are excited about is the Sony A7S. So Sony's got three of these mirrorless models now that look DSLR-ish. They got the A7, the A7R, and the very newest A7S. I saw somebody sum up these three in a very easy, simple way. Your A7, it's kind of your all-around good camera. Very similar to the 70D in the fact that it's good at photos, good at video both of those. It is a full frame, 24 megapixel camera. It's mirrorless, so it's smaller than your normal DSLR. It doesn't have to have room for that mirror to flip up and back down. So that means also that you don't get an optical viewfinder. It is an electronic viewfinder, EVF. So you got EVF and an LCD. Both of those are electronic. Major hit on battery life when you're talking about that. You are looking at like 380 some odd shots or so. Uh, A7R 
is very, very similar. All three of these cameras are basically the same on the outside from a distance or even pretty close. They all look the same. A7R 36 megapixels, 24 frames, or sorry, 30, 36 megapixels, um, like four frames a second. It, the A7 is like five or so. Uh, and that's more kind of your landscaper's dream. Really nice sensor in there, not so fast. You do video too with it, of course. Um, and then there's now the A7S, 12 megapixels. Now some of you might say, wait a sec, we're going backwards here. Yes, this is what we wanna see because the emphasis on this camera is amazing low light performance. But you were talking about 4K. Yes, and that 20, 20, I'm mixing all my numbers up. 12, 12 megapixel sensor is just big enough to do 4K. Oh. Right? Sure. 3,000 by 4,000. 12 million, 12 yep. megapixels, roughly. Um, there's, there's more that makes that camera special. Um, there are the processor in there and that sensor size gives it the ability to do no line skipping, uh, pixel by pixel sampling as it's pulling this video off. And I don't know everything that I'm talking about here because this is getting beyond me, uh, but it basically means really high quality video at very high bit rates. But there's a catch, and it's a pretty big one. What's the catch? If you want to shoot 4K with this camera, you have to have it connected to an external recorder. Oh, uh, yeah. See, I wondered about that. Because so, that's, 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 that data, so, a lot of data. It's a lot of data. So um, what, what do you mean by external? External recording mean a hard drive, an external hard drive. One of those, yes, the like the uh, the Atomos Ninjas, which is basically an external hard drive, flash drive, big. Some of them have built-in monitors that just sits there and slurps that information off right out of the HDMI cable. That's how they the Sony does it. Canon can do this as well um, with their high-end C100 3. Okay. They don't do it through HDMI. They they do it through some other ports. And again, I'm getting out of my area of expertise, so I you know I don't want to say a bunch of stuff that I don't know to be true. Um, but so the line with this Sony camera is 4K capable. Step below 4K down to your paltry 1080p, you can go up to 60 frames a second. You can do, uh, that's 60, that's 1080p, not I, not interlaced, so very nice. Um, and high, high bit rates, which think of that as your compression. The higher your bit rate, the lower your compression. So you're getting some really nice quality straight out of this. Stick a nice Zeiss lens on here, and it's very, very nice. Now, battery life, as I said, is not great, and there's no way to really conserve battery life. Like when we go to a wedding and shoot with the 5D Mark III or the 70D, um, if we're not using live view on the back a lot, man, you know, 1,000 shots, 1,500 shots before we need to replace a good battery. Yeah, but you know, on the other hand, there's our friend Micah, who's a videographer, and I've seen him burn through tons and tons of batteries doing video. That's true. I just tried so. to kind of compare apples and oranges. I was talking about photos versus shooting video. Right. Um, so that's a good point. But, so, you know, there are some sacrifices here, but overall really nice. And as I said, Lumoid sending along. So I will be talking about that this weekend uh, or next week. You'll see those videos up as I walk around and shoot with them. I've also got my hands on the Metabones adapter, which yeah. will allow me, do you know what that does? will allow me to um, put some Canon lenses on the Sony. Sony as well. Very cool. So we'll see. Very cool. I'll have and more it information also, about that. And doesn't it also um, change the depth of field, or is this not the... That was only when, that was only the Metabones adapter. That This is cool. There is a Metabones adapter speed booster. Oh, right. The speed booster. Defies the laws of physics. It doesn't really, but it almost seems to. Because what you can do with that is if you have a smaller uh, sensor camera, like the Sony Inet, no, oh, is it? What did I put it on? Yeah, I put it on. Yeah, yeah, sorry. you can put it on. If you can put it on APS-C size sensor and put a full frame lens on it, you can actually get wider apertures than the maximum on the lens because of magic. <laughs> we don't really know why. So, like, if you're shooting with the 50 f1.2 on the speed booster, you could actually be shooting at f1. Pretty cool. Yeah, and a slightly different focal length. Yep. Yeah. So it's nifty. So that was the news. Our friend Brian has a, um, has a oh, little a post nice about video. that. Oh, a nice video. Yeah. We'll post the link down yeah, below. Yeah, we'll post the link down below. Remind me because I, now we said a couple different things. But yes. 
Good. Um, well, just the last bit of news is other folks have been announcing 4K cameras left and right. A lot of like handy cams. Oh, right. National Association of Broadcasters really focused on video, if you didn't get that yet. Um, and a lot of handy cams with a 4K. Uh, the future is 4K. What I hear people say is, well, I, my TV doesn't even do 4K. Why would I want a 4K video? They'll catch up. They will catch up. The other big reason is you can then crop um, down to 1080 and have a lot more leeway. The same reason why it's nice to have more megapixels in some circumstances, because yeah. it gives you the ability to crop more uh, and reframe afterwards, um, zoom in. Yep. Yeah, good. Yeah. That's the news. That is the news. So you have a big announcement. I do. I kind of want to title this the big announcement nobody cares about. Because I thought about teasing. I've got a giant announcement, but then everybody's going to be like, he's going to give away a camera. That's what yeah. everybody says anytime I say that. Well, yeah. And I would like to That's what at I some think. point. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the next week. But um, quick little background, I do have a day job. I work for a small liberal arts college here in southern Vermont. It's called Marlboro College. It's nothing to do with the cigarettes. just happens to be in the town that has the same name. Wonderful place. Uh, I love working there. I love the people there. But... Over the last couple of years, building this, pointing to you all out there sitting and watching me, uh, watching us, I have had an absolute blast. Sometimes as I'm walking and I'm thinking about videos I'm going to make and interactions I have with you all, I get a little skip in my step. I really do. And I could get really heavy and talk about, you know, well, I don't want to get really heavy. I'll just say, very simply, that I have given notice at work. I am leaving my job. And I'm going to try, I have goals, we'll talk more about those in a minute, but I'm going to do this with you all, full time, 24-7. It's getting real. You weren't listening. What? I said 24-7. <laughs> I love working for you all. Um, and so it's exciting. Now, I'm, I've been really nice at work. They've been really nice to me, so I'm really nice to them um, and given them plenty of notice. I won't be leaving my job until the end of May. Now, those of you who pay attention say, gosh, you post a lot during the day. Some of those are scheduled posts, and I have some flexibility with my work. Uh, so some of that is work at work with you all, but so end of May I'll be leaving and my I'll just say my overarching overarching goal is to be able to make a living at this uh, And I would like to be able to sh I'm gonna share, you know sources of revenues revenue costs I think a lot of people right away like oh, he's this rich guy with all these cameras you know, I've worked really hard over the last two years. It's been longer than that, but it's really been the last two years where I've really started to pick up 24 seven, yeah. um, spent a lot some of momentum. time. Yep. Picked up some momentum, momentum. Um, actually really we're coming up on three years this summer, would I say? Uh, and well, yeah, let's leave it at that. Of course, there's going to be lots more information, but overall what I hope this means for you all is more videos, more videos, better quality videos, more in-depth videos, content. I wouldn't it be nice to interview some other interesting photographers. There are several of them that I know that are within an hour's drive uh, that have tons of great information to share. Uh, that you know, wouldn't it be nice to do more location? Oh, just lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. I've been talking too long about this. So no, but we'd like to know what you guys want to learn about and hear about, and what you guys want us to do, because we're you know you're working for them. Yep. So and I have I was looking around for my little book. I have my list. Leave um, a comment. Things. Yeah. Seventy D user guide. That's one thing that I am still working on slowly. Yep. yep. But what do you want to hear about? What Let us know. Hear? Okay. Leave a comment down below. Oh, That's and right. speaking of comments down below. People might be thinking we ignored the last one about whether or not you want to watch us live. Oh, right. We heard you. There's enough of you. That, sure, we're going to take some time. Uh, it's still going to be a couple episodes before we put any live stuff together. But we heard you. That's coming too.
Exciting. Isn't it? Yeah. Go get to watch me pick my nose before the show. I'm sorry. Yep. He likes to pick his nose a lot. So I guess we can move into um, a little discussion. So we both kind of ran into this article over the week. Um, it was posted on the slantedlens.com. And the title of the article was um, Seven Reasons Photographers and Videographers Don't Reach Goals. And today is a goal-setting episode. So, you know, you should definitely go read the article. Um, but we're going to... We're going to go through the questions, right? right? One of the things is, she's opening this up. One of the things I say, and the reason why I'm telling you I'm leaving my job to do this um, is for many reasons, because uh, I like to share with you all. But one of the things I think is to inspire. I made a goal a while back to say, to, to work towards a point at which I could feel safe enough, safe is a pretty big word, but safe enough to leave a a, a well-paying job with good people, good health insurance benefits to strike out on my own where day to day I'm not completely sure of my earnings. My health insurance costs me a lot more money out of pocket and no one's putting anything into retirement for me. It's all up to me, myself and I. So, But there are of course benefits that come along with the flexibility and things like that. But I made a goal a while ago and I worked hard towards that goal. I don't think all of your goal is to do this talking head, teaching photography, sharing reviews and stuff like that. But I do think that many of you have the goal to be a more serious photographer, either to make it a career and be a professional, I should put a professional photographer, one who, who actually makes a living at it, or just a better photographer. Um, and one thing that I want you to get away from out of this discussion is that it's going to take time. You can't think in two weeks I'm going to be an amazing professional photographer. Right? Right. right. Yep. It okay. takes time. Okay. So let's go through. They have seven items on this list. Let's hit the titles of each and then talk briefly about them. Okay. You want me to read them or are you going to keep going? No, I think we should keep going. Okay. So goals. The first, um, the first mistake or the first reason why most photographers and videographers don't reach their goals um, is they have general ideas. So do you want to talk about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, it's very easy to fall into the trap of, I want to be a better photographer. I'm going to shoot anything that comes my way. And I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think that the, <laughs> the point behind this one is that you should have specific goals. It's great to want to say, oh, I want to be a fashion photographer as a, um, you know, listed as an example here. But I think that to be able to accomplish a goal, you need to have something specific so that you can then measure it later on. Did I accomplish my goal? How can you measure whether or not you're a fashion photographer or a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer? You can't really measure that until you've been doing it for maybe several years, maybe, or until you feel like you've accomplished it. But it's more of an intangible sort of thing. Whereas if you say, I want to be shooting portraits at $300 a session, or I want to be profiting $300 from each session and shoot six sessions a week, that's a specific goal and you can work towards that. And that's the idea. It's the, you, if you set a general goal, it's harder to take the steps to make it happen and you don't have a clear vision of what you want. So you're saying even a, a general, a saying I want to be a fashion photographer, that even that is too general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You need to set very, so, very specific goals. Right. So you, right. I want to work with certain magazine, but even then, you know, even then, you know, I want to shoot a certain number of, of, or get certain number of clients or I'm going to work towards putting together a portfolio so I can get my first fashion client or something like that. You know, something that you can actually measure. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think this article, I should have read this article more closely. I, I skimmed it this morning. Um, but I don't think this article goes into talking about failure at all. And I will just say that I've been thinking about that a good bit and, and doing some reading in different places. And it actually occurred to me as I was driving home from work today, the safe work, uh, that this venture could fail. 
I could within a year or two realize that my overall earnings are not enough to sustain this and completely fail. And that's scary, but everything I read, you know, I'll figure out something next, uh, the next step. And so you can set a very specific goal and maybe you won't reach that goal, but having it out there that you're striving for um, is better than having something general. Yeah. And when you fail, then you figure out how you can adjust uh, either your goal or your perception of the goal. Yeah. And actually, you are wrong. They do talk about failure. Oh. The last, um, the last one? Yeah, the last okay. one is failure. We'll get to that then. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, let's failure. just talk about it now because it's, okay. it's in our minds. Um, well, their idea, what they're saying about failure is that sometimes we, meet, we mistake, we take failures and we get ourselves down. We let ourselves get down because mm -hmm. of failure. When instead we should be looking at it, well, we're taking certain steps to get to our goal. And even if we didn't accomplish everything we set out to do, we're still working towards that. And so that is a success in and of itself. And there's so, accomplishments along the way that may not have been goals, but still were significant. Right. So there are lots of good things that come out of failures. You, you know, you learn something that you won't do again if, you know, it was something that you did that didn't have the consequences you intended. Or if, um, you know, you... Yeah, so, I mean, many positive things can come out of failure, basically, is what they're saying. Okay. But um, back up. Number two. <laughs> so, two is they don't write down their goals. So, the idea is that you should set a very specific goal, you should write it down, oh, right. okay. and you should remind yourself of it constantly, so that you know that you should be working towards your goal, you know that you're, you are working towards your goal, and it motivates you to get there. So... It's important to not only think of a specific goal, but also to write it down. And, and how about, you know, I've heard this might sound a little silly, but I've heard of things like post-it note on the bathroom mirror. No, that's exactly what that is. Yeah. 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 Or if, you know, this, they actually suggested to make it into some kind of like typographic art and then frame it around and put it on mm -hmm. your desk. And that actually sounds kind of cool. Yes. So. Unless it's a really long goal. Unless it's a really long goal. But even then, I mean, the idea is just to for it to be in your face and for you to remind yourself constantly of it. Um, third is they have a beginner's mindset. Um, and the idea of it is, you know. She's trying to figure out the <laughs> idea of it. Well, <laughs> well, I read it, but I, I don't totally. There's so remember. many goals to, or so many points to keep them all in the mind. Yeah. So the idea behind this is that, you know, you approach, you approach situations um, like you're not really prepared to take them on. So you go to a shoot with the idea or the mindset that you're a newbie and so you can't really um, do a really good job at it. And, you know, and we all start somewhere. And hello, little kitty cat. This is Bean, everyone. Big Matt Bean. Um, so you can't. You, you have to own it. You have to know that you will make mistakes even when you have had lots of practice and lots of experience. And, you know, don't start with a beginner's mindset. Just know that you're working towards something. And I think they're fairly specific there in saying that if you want to be a wedding photographer, don't go shooting this or that. Stick to your goals. Now, I think that's it's easy to write that down and to say that, but when you're trying to put food on your table and get experience, I, I, can, I feel like I can really relate to the person who said, yeah, I'll shoot that, yeah, I'll shoot that. It might not be in line with their goal, but it gives you photographic experience and it gives you money if you're looking at paying jobs. Right, and I think that is okay. I don't think that you should turn down every job that isn't in line with what you want to do because that, to a certain extent, you do, to a very large extent, you do need to put money on the table. However, you shouldn't take this job and then market it as what, as something that you do. Like you shouldn't That's put that point. in your portfolio. You shouldn't be searching or seeking those types of jobs. You should still maintain your focus of what you want to do 
but you can shoot. If somebody asks you to shoot it and you think that you can accomplish it, you can do it well, you should definitely do it because you do sometimes need to put money on the table and that's just what, you know. And and maybe you would discover that, that that is a better thing too. Could you say Possibly, that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And change your goal? Are you allowed to change your goal? Yeah, but again, you need to be very specific. Yeah, so. Well, so. Number something else. Number four. Number four. They aren't accountable. And I can relate to this one very, very much so because I'm a huge procrastinator. Can I just can I just say I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Can I just say I wish that they didn't write these in the negative, that they said what to do, because every time you read them out I get confused and say, Wait, don't we want to be accountable? Right. Okay. Yeah. So they're so saying be accountable. Right. These are the mistakes. Yeah. So a mistake is they are not okay. accountable. And so one of the helpful tips that this article suggests is to have an accountability partner. And um, but this is basically a person that you check in with from time to time to make sure that they help you go over, you know, a to-do list or something that you, or your goals and make sure that they can help you um, figure out whether or not you have stayed on task and have, you know, follow what you set out to do. So. It's really difficult when you're self-employed, when you're a freelancer, to kind of motivate yourself to get everything done in a timely manner and just at all. Um, for some people, I mean, there are some people that are very self-driven, but I think, you know, a huge majority of people aren't. So, you know, you don't have to hold yourself accountable if it's really challenging, but definitely find some sort of way and some help from somebody else who can help you, um, who can keep you accountable. Um, yeah, so Good. that was number four. Um, five is they simply don't have a plan to reach their goals. Mm. Um, so uh, this says you need to have a plan to reach um, and try different strategies out over <laughs> a key, over a specific allotted time then evaluate, recourse, and continue. So yeah, so constantly checking yourself, making sure that you're on the right track, and this is why it's important to have measurable goals and measurable action plan so that you can, you can evaluate whether or not you're on the right track. If you aren't, then take the necessary steps to get back on track or regroup and move towards some other track. And, um, and then continue towards achieving your goal. Um, six is they don't look at their goals. So this is pretty straightforward. Basically, Post a note on the mirror. Right, yeah. So just keep reminding yourself. Um, and the last one we've already talked about, they take success for failure. Um, so again, yeah, so that's a mistake, taking success for failure. So it's about looking at failure in a different light. It's about saying, well, I didn't book these number of shoots, but I have taken steps towards achieving this goal, so that in and of itself is a success. So where am I failing, or not where am I failing, where, I, where could I improve? What could I change to actually reach my goal next time? So you haven't failed, you just didn't accomplish exactly what you set out to do, and that doesn't mean that you know you should just give up. It just means you should reevaluate and then you should see where the problem is and then think of a different way, think of a way to try to remediate it and then continue. Nice. Good. Yeah. Good. So you should guys you guys should totally look at this article. We'll, we'll put a link to this down below. Yeah. And you can look over it. But I think we covered it fairly well and you, you added in some really nice yeah. perspective. But yeah, and they I think that you know, whoever wrote the article also has coaching. Um, offers coaching for f business people in general. So, you know, sometimes you just need to hire somebody to help you too. And that's a, that's a good investment to make towards achieving your goals and growing your business. So. Right, right. I think that's something that we, as photographers, that's a great point that we often overlook is we're very quick to invest in gear, equipment, same thing, lenses, cameras. Oh, this will make me a better photographer or I need this. And if you take some time and invest in you, uh, your site, um, your marketing, those can actually those or those can often take you much further 
than a new lens will. And I know it's not as sexy or fun sometimes because when you get that the smell of a new lens. You smell your lenses, really, you go. <sighs> give them a little sniff. Um, you know, that's nice, that's fun. A new camera, that's fun. Marketing, eh, you know, Boring. but, but. But you'll see the, you know, the benefits. The return, the benefits return on investment. Yeah. Right, yep, good. Speaking of uh, new lenses, This is not a new lens. This is a Sigma 35 f1.4. It's relatively new. Relatively new. Um, we're very happy with it. And the Sigma 50 f1.4, the reviews are starting to come in. Very positive. Very, very, very positive. Lens looks really nice. Sigma is really they're knocking these out of the park. That's yeah. a baseball reference. I'd love to give the 51.4 a try. Yeah. Well... You know, the thing is with a Canon's 35, Canon's 35 f1.4 is an old lens. Yeah. It walks around with a little cane. Yeah. Um, and it was neat. Now, Canon's 50 1.4, it's a good lens. It's nothing amazing, but for it's the money, so it's very good. pretty old. Yep, but the value of that lens is How very good. How much is good. the 50 1.4, the Sigma? It's probably going to be eight to to a thousand dollars, eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Really, that's it. The fifty one four from Canon is only three hundred. Oh, the one four. I'm one sorry, four. I thought you were talking about the one two. Right, right. So is the so, fifty one four from Sigma supposed to be competing with the fifty one four from Canon or the fifty one two? I thought it was more of a high end. Well, lens. it is more of a high end lens. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. How often do you shoot at one two with the fifty? Uh, not very often. Hmm. Mm hmm. So if this fifty one four was sharper. Would you wouldn't miss that stop of it's not even a full stop of light. Um, no, I would miss it because it would mean that at it at one four it well you know depending on how good and how sharp this lens is, it technically because it's a if I shot at one four it would be its widest aperture it would mean that it's not as sharp because lenses usually aren't sharpest at their widest aperture so I would probably have to stop down to like one point eight or. 2.0, which is so fine. So you are saying you would lose a little bit more Yeah, light. but I don't know if it would be that big a deal. I mean, I shot with a 51.4 for a very long time. Reports are razor sharp, even wide open. Yeah, so I, I really want to try it out. I'm very excited about that lens. Note to self, send subliminal messages that Christina should spend money on a new 51.4 from Sigma instead of marketing. So Got next, it. next on our <laughs> list... Reader questions. We're into reader questions. All right, first one is just, you know, from time to time I get a question or something that comes across that makes me go, oh, what? <laughs> we, should, uh, we should start a new segment. It's like, oh, what? Oh, what? Somebody, Michaela. Michaela wants to take or wonders if a T5i is and a monopod will give them good video on the roller coasters for selfies. What? That what? actually might be fun. I'm just going to say that what? that would be really fun, I think. You're going to go to jail. What? You physics. You're going to go shooting in your loop-de-loop, -loop, holding a oh, camera. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. You, I mean, you don't really know what kind of roller coaster she's going to. I mean, it could be a really violent one, but it could be one of those, like, really m mellow ones. That's not a roller coaster. No one calls the mellow ones a roller sure coaster. They, they do. call those train rides. No. I mean, if you have that secured to a to a mon monopod, if you have the camera secured, unless you're going on those like super crazy ones. Can we just go through my scenario? You're going on the loop to loop. I feel like you're being such a buzzkill. You're holding this camera out that weighs over a pound on the end of a monopod. And monopods need, at the end of them, if you want something like a DSLR to be facing you, you need some kind of ball head at the end to bend it back your way. Otherwise, you just hold it out like that, and that doesn't help you at all. And those are heavy. I know I've skied with a monopod with a little ball head and the verb on the end, the Garmin, and that was heavy. My arm was starting. So you go whipping around a lower coaster, boom! Well, what makes you think that she's going to be flailing her arm like that? You're not going to be... I think it's a boy. 
Michaela, boy. I don't know. You're not going to be able to hold... Am I a weakling? I might be a weakling. You're not going to be able to hold a heavy camera out really? when you go... Think about how you're tossed around on a roller coaster. Well, but this you're is You're holding what I, on for dear life with your I eyes guess, clenched. Ah! I guess you're thinking about it the wrong way. This is what I'm thinking. There's a bar that's holding you in place, or I guess like sort of like a backpack strappy type thing. I mean, it's not a strap. It's like you. metal. Yep. So can't you like hold it up against the bar that's holding you in? Like just As grab... For a selfie? Yeah. So this close? If you have a really wide angle lens. That's going to be like a nose selfie. Not if you have a really wide angle lens. I thought we told people not to take really wide angle lens pictures of themselves. Yeah, but we're talking about a roller coaster here. Come on. <laughs> Adapt. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying it's not impossible. I don't recommend doing it because if something bad happens, yeah. you'll be sorry. Uh, it's first not off, worth it. I don't think they're going to let you on. Holding well, that. yeah, they don't let you. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to have it in a backpack or something. Don't you have to take your backpacks off? Or yeah, coasters? you sometimes you can't even wear shoes. Yeah. Like if you're wearing flip flops, they so, they make you take all that stuff off. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think so either. Even if I'm wrong about laws of physics and centrifugal force, centrifugal. I force. think if you hold no, this is what I, this I agree with you. If you hold it out like this for a selfie, like this, you will lose that, possibly even your arm. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you like securely hold it up against one of the bars that are holding you in place, I think you should be fine. Okay. But don't do it. Not worth it. Not don't worth do it. it. Okay. Great. Next question. More serious question. Lawrence. Lawrence asks this question. This is a good one. It's thinking about composition. Rule of thirds. We've talked about that in the critique show. If you haven't tried watching the critique show, go go watch. I'm really proud of, I think, some of the, the information that we share in that. It's making me a better photographer to think about these things. Oh, I keep telling people not to do this. I better stop doing it myself. Um, but specifically when taking a picture of a person, and we have some, ex we have two examples of me. Did you pick those two examples of me? Yes. Okay. And the question is basically, when you have a subject um, with a face mm -hmm. in your picture, you probably shouldn't put them dead center. I'm adding this in because you kind of that's usually boring. Um, you want to put them on one side or the other. Is it better for them to be looking into the frame or out of the frame? So the right answer or the answer that you would learn in like a photography class, like a basic photography class, I think is to have the subject looking into the frame because that leads the eyes back into the frame, then back to the subject, not out of the frame. So your goal is to keep interest, your subject interested in the image. However, if you're going for like a little bit of uh, mystery or just some sort of um, thematic element, I you have freedom to play and you know make your subject look outside of the frame. So, but in terms of making a very traditional portrait, your subject should be looking into the frame, if not at the camera. Is that a good enough answer? It's a great answer. Thank you. I didn't know you were done talking. What do you think about it? I agree. I really do. There are times where you can create some tension that might be interesting. Right, yes. Um, with the person looking out of the frame. Uh, but it really needs to be balanced with something yeah. over here. Um, right. You know, behind them. Uh, but it, it most of the time looks awkward. Yeah. Or, you know, I can, I actually just had some, a scenario pop into my head of when it would be appropriate. Like if you're having, if you're creating a conceptual image of somebody like looking back and they're not, you know, they could be nostalgic, they could be emotional, they could be angry, they could be whatever, but you know, you can have them on whatever side on either the left or the right side of the frame and then looking over their shoulder out, not in. And I think that would be fine and it would be purposeful and it would add to the thematic element that you're bringing into the image. So I think that would be an instance when it would work. It's just an example. I mean, there's plenty of others, but that's nice. just one. Good, thanks. And Lawrence also, this isn't a question, but uh, as a suggestion for us is to do kind of doctor photo sessions where people submit images that they know have potential, but just can't quite get them there. And with a little post-processing, hmm. maybe they could get there. 
Yeah. We can talk about doing that. I feel a little funny about that because, um, because I feel like that's so subjective. And what you should do to a photo is so subjective. And I think I like the fact that we just make, well, during the critiques, I like that we make suggestions and people kind of take, put their own spin on it, take it or leave it. Um, I guess if they willingly submit images to be post-processed by us, you know, it's a different story. But I don't know if we should be doing that stuff for people. I think that, you know, that they should kind of figure out what they like and, you know, we could do tutorials. We could do Lightroom tutorials on, you I'm know, a little how... more positive on it than, than you are. And okay. I, think, I think you're... White balance. Think about white balance for a second. And skin tones. Okay. Yeah, I feel like those could all be kind of Just separated into chunks. Okay. And, you know, be taught in a separate video in and of themselves. Well, but he... in terms of, like taking somebody else's image and saying, well, you should do this and this and this and this to it. I don't know how I feel about that. Okay. I'll, I'll just say this about the white balance and skin tones both is, oftentimes I will finish post-processing a picture, think it's pretty good, maybe I'll ask Christina to come by, or she just happens to be walking by, takes a look at it, and reaches over, and in five seconds, it looks much better. To my eyes, it looked fine, and then it looked much better. The thing is, though, when we do that, I find it. I find that you constantly are in need of my help to do it. Whereas, and and you're not learning to do it yourself. I am learning every time you do it for me. I don't think so, because by now you would know. <laughs> I'm slow learning. I'm not. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying that teach a man to fish. Person. A person to fish. They catch a fish. And they'll, yeah, give a man a fish or a person a fish. They'll be hungry tomorrow. So. It's true. Got philosophical, philo philosophical. Let's end it there. Okay. Right? Sure. That was it. We have our photos of the week. We're going to throw those up right now. I want to thank you so much for watching. Um, you know, this week Gary Instagrammed a picture. He was ironing some clothes, and there we were on a TV in his room uh, doing last week's mishmash. Love that. Uh, you know, just those little things are just really sweet, and we appreciate them. Uh, we do appreciate everybody who watches all the way to the end. Thank you. And if you're watching this and you haven't, for some reason, subscribed, take a moment and do that, please. That helps. And, yeah, that's it. Yep, thank you. Good night. Make sure you've entered the $50 giveaway gift card. I will be announcing the winner on Friday. Bye-bye.